types of fish uh, in these systems. Cards can make more sense when I show you the results, but think of it this way. You ask the question, uh, is the lake connected, yes or no? Yes, fish are present 100% of the time. No, fish are never present. That's what this analysis does. It breaks your data set apart in these rec recursive partitions, basically, to try to predict whether fish are present or not. Variables we used, uh, is there an upstream source? Is there a downstream source? You might think that an upstream source is more important because they can move with the flowing water. This might be a little harder because they have swimming against the current. Distance, how far do you guys swim as the fish swims, as we say, downstream versus upstream. Watershed area again, and then lake size and the maximum depth. Again, is can the fish get there, and can the fish stay there? The way we did this, you've got 82 lakes, and CART will always find the best model for predicting are there fish present or not. But it will always overfit, right? So that when you try to predict on some new lake, it doesn't work very well. So what we did was we broke the data set up and used 58 lakes, what we call a learning set, and used something called k-fold cross-validation. What that does is it leaves off a subset of those 58 lakes, finds a good model, but then tries it on those five or six lakes that are left out. If it doesn't work well, it makes the model simpler. It finds that sweet spot, so to speak, between an overly complex model and the one that's not too complex. All right? So that's the first stage, capable cross-validation of the learning set. We talk with the, the cart how to do it. Then the rubber hits the road. We turned around on 24 lakes that were not included in the original analysis, and we said, now try to predict fish presence and absence on the lakes. <coughs> because that's a good model. If you can use it on lakes that were even in the development of the model and it works, it's pretty robust. We we're actually pretty surprised at our results. We thought this would be a mess, it would be complex, we could never do it. We actually were able to predict fish presence or absence really well in a really simple model. Uh, it's lake depth and it's connectivity. So here's our 58 lakes for the learning set that stands for downstream fish source. This is literally what it does. If the answer to the question is yes, the lake would, did have a downstream fish source, 44 lakes, boom, every single lake had fish in it. If you were not connected with a downstream fish source, there were 14 lakes. The next best variable the model found was maximum depth, called Zmax. Here, if you were deeper than 2.15 meters, <coughs> boom, you had fish present every single time. If you were shallower than that, fish were never present. So there's two ways to have fish. If you're connected downstream, surprising that it's downstream and not upstream, but that's what the stats said, you'll always have fish. Or if you're not connected but you're deep enough, you'll always have fish. And the only one way to be fishless, you've got to be not connected, you've got to be isolated, and you've got to be shallow. And again, thinking about island biogeography, that makes sense. What we're saying is it's hard for the fish to get there in the first place. Even if they do get there, the lake is so shallow, they can't stay there. But you might be wondering, well, how do you explain this? If they can't get there, why is depth really, really important for some lakes having fish and some don't? And the answer is we've got to think about this in the right timeline. Um, periodically, it seems like more often than usual, but Yeah, I have a real quick question about that fish depth thing. Do, do, does that vary by um, how far north or south the body of water was? I mean, is it a, is it a winter kill phenomenon that determines that? <coughs> if it is, it seems like the northern, more northerly lakes that have more severe, longer winters would, would be more prone to, I mean, that depth would vary depending on north-south. Yeah, that's a really good question. We tried to break our, we have those, this, in this study we have two data points, up in Polk County and one down by Alexandria. We tried to run them separately, but you just don't have enough lakes to really do it well. I think you're probably right. If you did have enough lakes in those two regions, you could probably argue it two ways. Um, Polk County, especially those other regions we have up in the woods, uh, they do have longer, harsher winters. The ice was always thicker when we go out in the wintertime, but they're less productive. And so the dissolved oxygen levels don't decay as fast up north. Down south, the winter is shorter, but they're more productive, and those deal levels can really drop quickly in the wintertime. I actually don't know what the answer to that question is. It would probably differ, but I, I don't know which, don't know which way to go yet. We do know that, I'd probably guess, um, that winters are harsher in southern Minnesota, the zone we're working. Because if you look at our fish data, the biodiversity is much higher in those northern regions, not only Polk County, but uh, we've got a, a study site on Task State Park, we have a number by uh, Chippewa National Forest. You get five, maybe ten species of fish in those lakes. Um, Alexander's study here, especially down by Wyndham, two or three. And winter kills a lot more frequently. That's 
probably apply to. Um, Fashi cells are three, four, maybe five times higher. But it's really a, a question of yeah, dissolved oxygen in the, in the lake. It is. And it's just how long is it's two things, as you know. Like the, the, the longer you're frozen, the more right. time you got to decay down. Right. Um, but the more productive you are, the more decomposition you have. It's an interesting question. So, okay. Great. Thanks. Um, we actually did a whole bunch of dissolved oxygen measurements in these systems. We deploy sons all winter long. We can't find oxygen anywhere in these lakes. You come sample in the spring and it's still full of fish, right? These, especially the bullheads and the fat hills are just incredible at being able to survive. Um, so explaining these, these fish uh, being present in lakes that are, are deep but they don't have any connection, well, the right timeline we get these periodic 500 year, 1,000 year floods that basically connect everything. And this is when these systems are getting colonized, right? Then the water levels go down, and if you're too shallow, the fish are eliminated. But if you're deep enough, you persist decades, if not hundreds of years into the future. And this is why when we're out there and looking around, we pull our traps, man, there's fish in here. Oh, you can't even see water anywhere. But with a thousand year flood, it prevents, or it provides the opportunity for, for those things to be So I think we have to think about this with the right uh, frame of mind. So to summarize part three here, really simple, right? One of the primary drivers of lakes shift to the states, it's simple. It's high fish biomass and high phosphorus levels. Uh, but we can do a little bit better than that. And that brings me into what are the implications of these state shifts for uh, managing shell lakes and conservation biology. We can do better than just telling <coughs> lake managers, control your fish, control your phosphorus. For phosphorus, try to maintain ideally below 50 micrograms per liter. If you do, you will have chronically clear water state of lakes. If you get above 350, you can't get a clear water state. You've got to reduce your nutrient levels first before you do anything else. We can also tell them they are going that a fish manager doesn't have anything to do with that. Pardon? A fish manager is going to have a hard time controlling the amount of phosphorus getting into the lake. Right, and that's why people have focused a lot on the fish. You know, the systems will, if you control phosphorus inputs, right. the, they'll get buried in the sediment and slowly phosphorus levels will tick down. Well, we don't have 50, 100, 200 years for phosphorus levels to go down, so we need to focus on those fish communities. Um, they're absolutely right. Now, the fish side, we can tell the <coughs> um, that these are the things that you need to look out for. Now, the larger lakes that are connected to the water bodies will have the most fish. And the deeper lakes that are connected to the water bodies will be most likely to have fish present in the first place. Um, and to put this into pictures, this is back when I was a doctoral student, so I'm going to state, uh, one of the first undergrads I, I worked with, I spent five years studying these fishless wetlands, and water level came up, and the highway department put this culvert in, and fat and minnows that are in that little net colonized through my study sites. I didn't even realize they're all connected. But there's just no rules really on that. The water comes up and they've got to get rid of it. We do have to manage water, right? We can't have people getting flooded, etc. But we have to consider the implications of these fish moving around because they have such a strong influence on these alternative stable states. The other part I really want to emphasize is historically, conservation biology focused on patches of habitat and connectivity. Right? Connectivity was good. It allowed gene flow organisms from patch to patch. It might be the true for the fish, but if you facilitate movement of fish from basin to basin, you're going to facilitate shifts to the turbid water state. And so, sure, we need to manage complexes of wetlands, but we also need to look up for these little guys, these isolated wetlands out in the middle of nowhere all by themselves because they are the ones that are most likely to be clear through time, and they're probably most likely to be fishless. In fact, that 11 lake study that I showed you where we cored those 11 lakes through time. There were, I think, four lakes that have been chronically clear. This is one of them. What do they all share? They're shallow, they're small, they're isolated. <coughs> and they never flip states. So we need to identify these lakes on the landscape and maintain their, their integrity. Well, why care about say small? How small is that? How isolated? Uh, that is, from memory, four and a half hectares. And it's got this little, you know, type one or two over here, and then there's another one right here. Other than that, there's another water body one mile away. Okay. By isolated, what I mean is 
we really, Sean Vaughn from DNR Waters, when he was doing the water shifts, we kind of really wrestled with this because he's a hydrologist. He's like, water goes somewhere. Everything's connected. Yeah. But we had to find a compromise with, okay, what about a line for a 500-year flood? This is one of those bases where everything flows in. And so when it rains, boom, this thing jumps up a lot, but it's not flowing from, from somewhere else. Okay. So why do we care about all these alternative stable states? Um, what are the implications for ecosystem services? I could talk about this for quite a while, but I'm just going to show you a couple of highlights that we've worked on. Um, oops, no way. Mark Hansen actually did his PhD, one of my collaborators did his PhD in Lake Christine out in western Minnesota. This is the lake that really got the interest going in alternative stable states in Minnesota and actually the world. They didn't even know. There wasn't a concept really for alternative stable states yet when they published this. Um, but what you're looking at is Christine is an enormous lake, six miles across. At certain points in time, one fourth of all the canvas backs in the continental US will be sitting on that lake. But what they realized, looking through time, the duck abundance would be really high in the lake. There's the ducks on the left, and then it would drop and it would go back up. Well, lo and behold, there's magpie occurrence. This lake was shifting between states. When it was clear, there's lots of plants, you had lots of ducks. When it went turbid, you had no ducks. When it got clear, the duck population went back up. A simple explanation, these waterfall either submerged aquatic plants or invertebrates, and both are higher when you're in a clear water state. So really, really serious implications for uh, habitat. That's for ducks, amphibians, even the fish do better when they're in a clear water state. More recently, we looked at species richness of aquatic invertebrates and submerged aquatic plants found that it's higher in lakes and clear water states. This was done by uh, St. Thomas undergraduate Luke Novi. And this is part of our big 107 lake study across the state. What you're basically looking at is across all the turbid and clear lakes, the richness ratio, so the number of species found in clear, divided by the turbid lakes. For submerged aquatic plants and aquatic invertebrates. And so uh, this basic max pairs t test shows that that ratio is significantly higher than one for both the plants and the bugs. Now you probably say, well, and this is kind of just a no-brainer. You've got fewer species of plants in lakes when they're turbid. Sure, but nobody had quantified it. 240% higher species richness when you're clear compared to turbid. That is a really big deal if you're a conservation biologist. Aquatic invertebrates, only 140% higher when you're clear compared to turbid. But the point I want to make is this says taxon richness, not species richness. We didn't have the money, the time, or the energy to identify all those invertebrates down to the species level. So most of our identification was to family, order, or maybe genus. So what this means is we're losing entire families and orders of invertebrates when you flip over to the clear water state. <coughs> huge, huge effects. Now this is interesting information for the invertebrates and the plants, but for the invertebrates, because <coughs> it tells you the overall pattern of species richness going up or down. Well, which taxonomic groups are being impacted, right? Well, that we don't know. So we follow that up with what's called an indicator analysis. It tells you which invertebrate taxonomic groups occur more often and in greater numbers in clear versus turbid water states. What we found is that there's a number of different indicators. Mayflies, dragonflies, damselflies, caddisflies, sandwiches, amphiflies, bladder snails, ranch horn snails are all more common, more commonly found, and much higher abundance in Clear lakes compared to turbid, and only two indicators of the turbid lake, things called copepods and bosmina. If you're not really familiar with invertebrates, these are about as small of invertebrates as you can find in the lake, and these are among the largest. So what this tells us is not only is there less biodiversity when you flip turbid, but the taxonomic composition changes, and from a duck perspective, the largest invertebrates disappear once you go turbid, probably because of loss of habitat, there's no refuge from fish predation, and there's more intense fish predation. And all you're left with are the invertebrates that are small enough to avoid fish predation because their body size is just so small. So huge, huge effects on uh, all invertebrates. Another St. Thomas undergraduate, uh, Luke Ginger, um, looked at the effects of alternative stable state <coughs> on nutrient level. Now this is, this is a little bit of mental gymnastics here. We spent the whole time saying phosphorus influences state. But state can also turn around and influence <coughs> nutrient levels, right? We change all these plants in a lake. What does that do to phosphorus and nitrogen dynamics? Well, he looked at 20 lakes, a subset of these 107, that had flipped states naturally just while we were watching, plus four other lakes that experimentally flipped from turbid to clear by uh, killing off the fish with rope. What you're looking at is a nutrient ratio clear divided by turbid, 
for total phosphorus and total nitrogen. So phosphorus was significantly reduced when it went to the clear water state. But again, the important thing is the effect size. 35% reduction in phosphorus within one year after you flip it clear. The effect for nitrogen is even bigger, almost a 65% reduction in total nitrogen levels. So if you're a lake manager and you're concerned about this green water full of nutrients flowing downstream, you can flip these lakes and have a positive impact on the receding waters. So where's all this nutrients going? Well, for both phosphorus and nitrogen, Instead of being tied up in the water column and floating downstream in algae, it gets tied up in plants and paraphyte. Right? So with phosphorus, it doesn't go anywhere. It's still in the lake, it's just not up in the water column. So if you flip turbid again, you could be you know, going right back downstream again. But nitrogen is the interesting part. I don't have time to get into it today, but Luke's got some really strong evidence that when you flip clear, denitrification rates in the lake go way up. We think that's the difference. Why do you get a much bigger impact with nitrogen compared to phosphorus? This loss is a permanent <coughs> loss by denitrification rates going up. And if you forgot about your denitrification, that's the conversion of nitrate to N2 gas back to the other atmosphere where it belongs. As you probably know, we've got a huge global nitrogen problem. Way too much nitrogen in the biosphere. What this indicates is that if we, we can manage nitrogen at the landscape level, on managing these lakes for the clear water state. The denitrification rates go way, way up. So just to summarize and pull all this together in a big full cartoon here, why be concerned about alternative stable states? Well, there's all kinds of, of ecosystem services that are impacted. I just talked about three of them. Turbid states have negative impacts on wildlife, fisheries, habitat, they reduce biodiversity, and they degrade water quality. So it goes both ways, right? Phosphorus favors the turbid water state, but phosphorus also favors high nutrients flowing uh, downstream. And you can predict pretty well this turbid water state based on the phosphorus levels and fish biomass. And we can take that back a step further and predict fish biomass based on whether you're connected, how big you are, um, and then you can get fish present in the first place based on how deep and connected you are for the fish presence. Um, you might be wondering, wait a minute, how come you got all this work going upstream from, from fish? You've done all this work over here, Phosphorus is all by itself, right? That's the million dollar question. Why do some things <coughs> have high phosphorus levels and others don't? The answer is, bring Kelsey back on the slide. She's currently working on that, chapter two of her dissertation, so, so stay tuned. So in conclusion, the frequency of turbid states has increased in lakes over the last 100 years. Um, there weren't any turbid water states until about 60 years ago, but now we've got about half the lakes in the prairie regions of Minnesota being turbid. You can predict pretty well that turbid water state based on phosphorus levels and fish biomass. They seem to be the most important factors causing it. And we can predict fish biomass based on connectivity, large lake size, and uh, greater depths. They all facilitate high fish in the turbid water states. The last thing they should be managed in the clear water state through their positive effects on wildlife, biodiversity, water quality, and all kinds of other uh, ecosystem services. So, thank you very much. As we said a long time, we should get up and do some jumping jacks. <laughs> Not so much a question as a comment. You know, you, you state that 1915, you see this, this uh, change over, if you will, to more and more uh, green lakes. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, hypothesize that that has to do with, first off, mechanized farming being introduced. <coughs> so if you're draining everything you possibly could at that point in time, given the resources that they have. And that's continued you know, for 80 years, or actually 100 years long. Um, and so I just think, for me, the integral part is the land use. The way that we've used the land has had such a major impact on our hydrology and, and the nutrients that are delivered to through our hydrology. But, uh, you know, you've been able to quantify, you and others, uh, some really cool stuff. And I, how, does it, how, how do you use that as a tool now? to go back to that land management part that would wake us up and say, look, at, we're ruining everything that we're living in here. Right. No, that's a good question. And so <laughs> this, is, this is kind of the, you know, we broached the applied ecology and these fun theoretical models they work in the real world. But it also, um, we do this because we want to provide lake managers information to, to do their job as effectively as they can. And so I think the real take-home message from this 
Phosphorus is very important. But unless we get some new technology that really allows us to reduce internal phosphorus loading in these systems, we gotta wait for Mother Nature to, to do her thing. Um, in the meantime, we need to develop these other techniques. Well, we need to do a couple things. Um, I need to put it back up, but we need to make sure that we manage watershed so we don't keep pushing those lakes along that gradient so we get to that bifurcation point and you flip turbid. Right, so we need to continue <coughs> watershed management to prevent that, but also if you reduce the inputs, permanently bearing phosphorus, which happens, will happen more quickly and you'll move down that, that stability gradient where you want to be. Um, and the second part is, while that's happening, you can work with these in-lake factors associated with, with fish to actively manage these systems for the clear water state. People have asked, when you flip them clear, Sometimes the last five years, sometimes ten, they'll go back turbid. And people will say, well, aren't you wasting your time? And I, I would answer that saying, no. We've actively pushed these systems to be unstable and be in turbid water states. Until the nutrient levels drop, it's going to require active management to keep pushing them back over to the clear water state for all these things. And that might happen more because, uh, you know, the bigger, deeper lakes are uh, not as much land is available for housing around those anymore. Yeah. More and more people are choosing the shallow lakes because that's all that's left or because at this point in time, it's quieter, you know, right. and so forth. So you might see more public pressure over time to keep some, you know, keep the, the clear ones that are shallow clear. And uh, if they understand that there's ways of pushing a, a green one back into the clear zone, then maybe you'll get more support to do that. Yeah. It's the, we also like to talk about multiple stressors. Um, Lake Christina, we, uh, Will, one of my collaborators, wrote a really neat paper. We did a thorough reconstruction of what's happened to that lake over the last 200 years. What he found is that several things happened. One of them is what you're talking about, the ag development in the, in the wash, and that kind of stuff. <coughs> but that wasn't the sole trigger. You can see the, you know, kind of starting to get wiggly. But then uh, I got colonized by common carp, second stressor. And the third one that really seemed to kick it over the, the threshold, so to speak, is they put a water control structure on because downstream of Lake Christina is Lake Pelican, it's a fishing lake. And so they didn't want the water to drop too low in Pelican so they'd have winter kill. So they thought, well, we'll store the water in Lake Christina so that we can let more out if we need it. Not knowing that just a foot and a half in Lake Christina, you know, less light reached the plants, winter kill became less common, those common carp, and all of a sudden, boom, it flipped over to the turbid water state. So it can be lots of different things, but, but it's always water down fish. dispersed all over the landscape. But those are the ones that got drained, right? So now you're a duck and you're looking around for some place to raise your brood, and you're forced onto the fours and fives because that's all that's left. So you're getting this competition from organisms that naturally try to sort themselves out, fish versus waterfowl. When you drained all those ones, twos, and threes, the water had no place to flow, so it flowed into the remaining fours and fives. And so these lakes are much deeper than they have been historically. Um, and what does that do? Well, it favors fish year after year after year. And that flooding, you know, is worse and it connects more basins and so you have, have more fish. And it's not, just, it's not just us, but your old advisor down in Iowa State um, has saw, seen the same thing in their wetlands. That fish are major drivers of, of these ecosystems and it's connectivity. We really need study in North Dakota, right? They're dry out there. I remember when I was out in graduate school in 1995, I, Graduate advisor from Jamestown, North Dakota, he's a research biologist out there. He's like, I don't know, I guess he's studying fish. We don't have any in North Dakota. But they've 
gone the Minnesota route, and they've started doing a lot more connectivity and drainage because of all the commodity prices, et cetera. And they've gotten wetter in the last 20 years. And they just published a paper. They did a survey 35 years ago. No fish anywhere. They redid the study. Guess what? Fish in about half their basin. So it's everywhere. And they're right. Climate, more water, shorter winters, it's just going to get worse. Are there any positive ecosystem services from the turbid state? You know, we've looked really hard <laughs> trying to find some, you know, silver lining, but we haven't um, found anything. You could <coughs> try to argue uh, that it benefits uh, fish feeding waterfowl, cormorants, loons, et cetera, better. But the, the uh, wildlife biologists I've talked to said no, they need water clarity. Um, and all you get is higher densities, but then the, the predatory birds can't see them very well. We've looked at carbon sequestration, and they're actually uh, similar for a long story why, but they bury as much carbon in your versus clear. Um, so if, if there is one, we haven't, we haven't found it yet. Um, and the, another big thing is, is human recreation. Um, it, nobody wants to put anyone with a cyanobacteria one. Um, but everybody loves looking over the side at bugs and fish and it's like a little aquarium, you know, they're small enough, there's no wind, and it's hard out there to get your work done, because it's just fun, when Christina's out there, it's just fun to look over. You guys study wetlands, you know what I'm talking about, it's just, they're, they're neat systems when they're clear. So, we don't, we don't have that yet. I think those, those bifurcation points have a lot of management implications, so you know, if you put your effort into this lake, it's going to work, you know, or it's, it, it, it helps to prioritize things. Yep. Yeah. And, it is, and Joy's actually doing a follow-up analysis where that's across 107 lakes, and now she's trying to finesse it so that how do those numbers vary as lakes get larger or deeper? Because um, we, it's not 350 for everybody. That's the average. Right, it'd be better to, to get a more predicted value across those other factors that are potentially important. But what she's also working on is can you go out and take a really simple sediment core and analyze it pretty cheaply and tell the DNR the problem, where are you on that threshold gradient? Is this a lake that you've got a high probability of flipping or are you way over here where you're wasting your time? Total phosphorus can get you there, but if those diatoms really integrate much better over it. Thank you very much. It was a long time sitting, so everybody stand up and stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.